I have six o'clock and we want to start in a timely way to respect everybody's time. Uh, I'm Tyler Palmer. I'm a deputy city supervisor for the city of Moscow. Uh, I oversee what's called the Public Works and Services Group. Um, and I have with me on the call today, Kyle Steele. Uh, Kyle is the Environmental Services Department Manager. I have Kelly Cooper and Kelly works in the Environmental Services Department and has done a lot of the drafting on the Climate Action Plan. And we're also really honored to have Steve McGeehan with us who is our longtime chair of Moscow Sustainable Environment Commission, which is a citizen commission that works on sustainability issues um, and climate issues for the city of Moscow. And we're really happy to be here today for this open house uh, on Moscow's climate action plan. And we really appreciate everybody who's on the line. I see that there are several people that have called in. Uh, this is our first uh, live, or excuse me, digital online public, or, uh, public meeting, open house. Uh, so we hope that we don't run into any technical difficulties, but by all means, let us know if we do, um, and we'll try and get them solved for you. Our goal tonight is to give an overview of the Climate Action Plan. Uh, the Climate Action Plan draft is available on the City of Moscow's website, if anybody would like to follow along as we go through this, um, and also give the opportunity for some questions. We've received a number of questions already that we will be answering some of them here tonight. And then we will save some time tonight to field some live questions um, that we will answer. So you'll, you'll see that you have a, the ability through this to submit a question. Um, and so if you submit a question, we will try to answer as many of those as time will allow tonight. But do know that any question that gets submitted, uh, we will keep track of and it will be included in a comprehensive question and answer sheet that we will include in a report that will go to the city council in April. Um, so. Uh, with that, I'm going to just give a brief overview of how we've gotten here and what it is that we're working on, um, the direction that we've received from the city council and the reason that we've drafted what we've drafted. Um, and then we'll ask uh, the Steve McGeehan, our SEC chair, to provide some comments on the work that his group has done in furthering this effort. And from there, we'll have Kelly Cooper go through an overview of the plan. We won't go through it in brutal detail, but we do want to provide an overview of the actions and the strategies that are included in the plan. Um, and then uh, we will have a brief public comment period or, or question and answer period at the end uh, with as much time as we've got left. But as I mentioned before, please don't be discouraged if we don't field your question here live because we will make sure that we have a comprehensive, comprehensively answer any questions that are submitted. Uh, we, we are recording this session. And so we'll make that available as well for anybody who would like to see it or review it, or if there's somebody who would like to watch it that wasn't able to log in tonight. And so we will record and make that available on the same page of the city's website. So with that, I, I just wanna start off and talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, the city of Moscow has a long history of, of climate action. The city established what was the first measurable goal by any city in the state of Idaho, which was a goal for 20% a 20 reduction in carbon emissions by city operations by the year 2020. And that was, that was a goal that was established initially in 2008, um, and it was reiterated in 2010. And that's a goal that we accomplished this last spring. We celebrated that with the city council in a workshop in April. Uh, and we were very happy to have reached that goal and actually achieved that 20% reduction. So that was something that was, was very significant. Um, in the aftermath of that, uh, we received some pretty clear direction that from the council that there was a desire that we continue to set aggressive benchmarks for the city to pursue. The 20% 20 by 2020 goal was exclusive to city operations. Um, so it only represented the emissions from city operations. It was not a community-wide goal. And in February of 2020, the council established climate change as, what, as a major challenge area in their strategic planning. The strategic planning effort is the, is the method that the council uses to establish priorities for staff. And so it's how they give us direction on the things that they want us to pursue and want us to be working on. So when that was established as a, as a major challenge area in a subsequent workshop, we received guidance from the council on the formulation of a climate action plan. In September of 2021, in a, in a workshop, in a follow-up workshop with the council, we were directed to, uh, to pursue climate action um, and, and goals that were in line with uh, the Race to Zero campaign, which is a campaign that, was, that is run by ICLE, which is the International Council for Local Government Initiatives. It's a, it's a large organization that works on climate change initiatives and has a focus on local government. Um, 
and and also the uh, race to so that was the race to zero, and then also the RF one hundred that uh, is a Sierra Club initiative um, that contains similar provisions. And Kelly can cover that in more detail a little bit later on. So the council instructed staff to use those benchmarks as the benchmarks that we would pursue as we drafted this plan. Um, and so this plan is, but the the significant component of this is that they also instructed us that they wanted it to be a community-wide plan, that this was no longer just a goal for city operations, that we, they wanted to set benchmarks and goals for the community as a whole. And that is what is included in this climate action plan as well. And so through this effort, uh, we, a lot of people to thank, there were a lot, there's a lot of heavy lifting that went into this and we were able to, uh, to use a lot of resources from other cities that have been engaged in similar efforts, um, both in the state of Idaho nationally and from around the world. And so that's, it's, it's a great, it was really encouraging through that process to see that we're not in this alone um, and that there are a lot of local entities that acting in concert really can have an impact on, on the emissions worldwide. And so that was a very encouraging process to go through. Um, so uh, with, the, with the, 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 our process moving forward from here is that we are in the middle of the public comment period. As I mentioned, we have received several comments via email. Um, anybody can submit throughout the public comment period on the city's webpage, uh, and we will address those and include those as we, as we finish our, our review of this process. And then we will have a council workshop on April 25th. And at that council workshop, we will, we will review this document with the council and receive their direction and guidance on how they want us to proceed from there. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Steve McGeehan and ask him to provide some remarks on the Sustainable Environment Commission and their efforts. And then directly after Steve, I'll have Kelly just jump right into the review of the Climate Action Plan. Well, thank you, Tyler, and I'm pleased to be here tonight and pleased to see we progressed to this point. Uh, you, you're taking me way back, Tyler. I remember 2008 and talking about the, the 20 by 20, 20% 20 by 2020, and certainly pleased to see that. And uh, that makes me think the city has been so great at soliciting input uh, from citizens as well as commissions like the Sustainable Environment Commission. Uh, in addition, uh, we've had several groups. You mentioned the RF100 uh, Sierra Club initiative and representatives have come to the SEC meetings a couple of times and we've worked with them uh, on their goals. Uh, we certainly have uh, worked with the Citizens Climate Lobby uh, and their representatives as they prepared to interact with city uh, administration and the city council. Uh, high school groups like the Climate Justice League have come to the commission. And so uh, in a nutshell, uh, climate change has been a standing agenda item for well over a decade. And so that brings us to today. And I, as I said, I am pleased to see this open house and the beginnings of the climate action plan being discussed. One other thing I'll mention is the uh, citizens survey that took place in 2017. It was the first commission survey that the city put out. And one of the questions there was, I'm going to paraphrase, are there concerns with regard to climate change uh, as it affects things like precipitation, snowpack, uh, pests, uh, you know, water recharge of the aquifer and all that. And uh, without going through all the details on it, uh, the answers from the respondents was overwhelmingly yes, there is a concern. It was about 68% said they were either very concerned or concerned with climate action and its impacts on life on the Palouse. And so uh, one other group I want to mention before I turn it over to Kelly is the uh, Climate Action Working Group or COG as it's abbreviated. That's a subcommittee of the Sustainable Environment Commission made up of some of our members and community members. Uh, and they've been instrumental in really getting the ball rolling on a climate impacts assessment and working with city staff to get to where we are this evening. So again, I wanna thank the, the, the city I want to thank the commission members and certainly the city staff that I've worked with uh, to get to the point we're at right now. And Kelly, you're up. Hi, um, as Tyler said, I'm Kelly Cooper. I, I did a lot of work on the climate action plan and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see my presentation here. Okay. All right. 
So let's just kick this off here. So we're going to talk about the climate action plan. I'll walk you through um, the majority, the major points in the plan and kind of the organization of it and hopefully get some feedback from you. Um, so quick, quick agenda for this presentation is just, we're going to go over the goals that are stated in the plan um, for reduction in sequestration. We're going to go over the actions for both community and city operations. And then we'll do a summary of those comments uh, that we've received thus far. So first up is the goals. Obviously, you can't have a plan without a goal, right? So the goal here is to be net zero by 2050 for our community-wide. Net zero in this case is both reductions and sequestration to even it out. So actual reductions and actual pulling of the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, with that, we also have a science-based reduction target of 56.6% reduction by 2030 for community-wide. That was uh, determined by ICLE, the, I forget what it stands for. Um, they helped us get that number through some of their technical expertise. The idea is that that's our fair share uh, based on our emissions historically. Um, we also want to continue our reductions in-house and take care of our own house. So we have a net zero target by 2035 for city operations. And all of those things, we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at our equity piece. So we're looking at our citizens and what we can do for them. This plan is meant to benefit our citizens, not just us. Um, so we want to make sure we're looking to improve human health, advance equity, and build resiliency into our plan. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the, uh, the emissions and where we are right now. That is included in detail in the actual draft plan. Reason being is because where we really need and want your feedback is with the actual actions that are included in the plan. So in order to give the most time for that and for your questions, we're going to skip ahead to this. So within the plan, each, each emission type, so community or, or city operations are broken up. So the plan is broken up into two pieces, one for community and one for city operations. Within that, this is kind of the structure that the actions follow. So we have each sector, which is like a group of emission types that all come together. Within that sector, we have strategies. And then under those strategies have specific actions. So this is kind of how you'll, you'll notice the structure moving forward. So we'll cover community actions first. So our first sectors, this is actually three different sectors within the community emissions profile. Um, res commercial, residential, and industrial sectors are all really similar in where their emissions actually come from and how we could impact them. Um, so for the sake of the climate action plan, they're all lumped into it together. Uh, the big one here is grid decarbonization. This is where we get this, the, meeting this RF100 goal of 100% clean energy that Tyler mentioned earlier. Uh, this is also where we get the biggest savings as far as emissions reduction, is getting that carbon out of our energy grid. Uh, for city operations, for example, oh, skipping ahead of myself, sorry. Um, about 45% of emissions come from our electrical use in the community. So being able to pull that carbon out of the grid is really smart. Um, so we want to do what we can to support Avisa's efforts to decarbonize its grid. And we also want to help promote participation in Avisa's My Clean Energy program. The reason being is that not only helps Avista decarbonize a little bit quicker, it also provides money that can be granted to local nonprofits and schools uh, to help them put in renewable energy structures, such as solar panels. We also want to take a look at building efficiency. Uh, this is where we can get rid of you know, energy waste things like incandescent light bulbs. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these programs exist to help businesses and homeowners switch these out. We want to help Vista and others make that happen. Um, and engage customers at the same time. We want to educate them as far as best management practices. Same goes for building electrification. Getting rid of that natural gas is great, um, but we don't want to force anybody. We need, to, we need it to be an educational choice that people make. So we want to help educate developers, consumers, government officials on the benefits of going all electric. 
And then, um, of course, we have renewable energy. So finding a way to help educate consumers on the benefits of renewable energy, but also developing some kind of community solar program. Next, we'll cover transportation. So this is our cars. This makes up a huge chunk of our emissions as well. Uh, one of the biggest ways to impact that is to reduce the vehicle miles traveled. That's our strategy here. Um, we can do that through multitude of ways. One is which is make our, our town more walkable or bikeable, um, but also increasing access to uh, mass transit like smart transit, for example. Um, and then also develop and expand alternative transportation options. So this is where you get into the um, shooter, scooter, sorry, my mouth's dry. Scooter share or bike share type programs, car share, uh, those sorts of things to get people out of your typical gas powered vehicles. Um, and on that end, we also need to do, look at electric vehicle adoption. So right now, one of the big barriers to electric vehicle adoption is there not being infrastructure for charging um, in town. Um, a lot of places, for example, like Multifamily housing doesn't necessarily have easy access for somebody to charge their vehicle at home. So those are things we need to look at and improve on. Solid waste. So this is another big one on education. Um, is to look at ways we can reduce waste. So we want to enhance our, our existing programs, of course, um, see what we can do about our recycling programs, getting better diversion there. Uh, but we also want to look at compost program. So this would be, you know, at home food scraps and that sorts of thing, looking at building a program around that. Um, you know, we, we're looking at a lot of growth already. So what can we do to update our construction and demolition standards, maybe to divert more waste there? We're not creating excess waste. And then of course, consumer education. A lot of waste can be prevented right from the source. If you're not buying it, it doesn't need to be thrown away. Um, so there's that piece to this. And we have our water and wastewater treatment facilities. Um, the big one here for the community wide is actually water conservation. If we're not flushing excess water that needs treated, then we're not treating it. We're not having to pump it around. Um, any reduction in electrical use we can get through these programs um, is fine. All right, now we're gonna to go to the other end of the scale. So we talked a little bit about how we can reduce our emissions, but now we need to talk about how we can get it out of the air. So the big one here is augmentation of our urban tree canopy. Trees pull a lot of carbon out of the air and they store it for a really long, long time. So we wanna take a look at developing or improving a tree program for the community, um, but also our Wisecape program. So the big, the big thing here is that all plants sequester carbon. Uh, but not all of them get it deep down in the ground where it can be stored properly um, without the chance of re-release. So we want to provide education for citizens on the benefits of planting native species um, or even other drought tolerant species. So it pulls the, the roots, pull it deeper into the ground. Okay, now we'll go over city operations. This will look, look, look a little different. It's a little bit smaller scale. Um, our operations account for around, it's around two and a half to three percent of all community emissions. So it's really, it's really just a drop in the bucket, but we still feel it's important to do our part and to, to lead the way for our citizens. So um, in general, we can look at renewable energy credits. So this is where we would um, participate in a VISTA's My Clean Energy program. Uh, on our electric bill, um, and it would allow us to offset up to 60% of our emissions just through this, because a lot of our emissions come from electrical use within the city. Buildings and facilities, we want to increase our energy efficiency in our buildings. So we want to continue our energy efficiency upgrades. This can be things like LED lighting or improved HVAC systems or improved boilers, and those sorts of things. We can also look at our building envelopes. Let's do an assessment of our buildings and see where we might have some energy waste happening. If we're not wasting the energy, we're not using as much and getting those, those issues fixed. 
And then of course, building electrification. So that's getting rid of our natural gas and buildings where we can. Street lights and traffic signals. We've already seen a lot of success in this category um, leading up to our 2020 goal. A lot of that's because we went to LED upgrades for things like our traffic lights and a lot of street lights. We still have some left to do, which is why it's still included here. We need to finish that out. Um, but also looking at things like our ball fields and our parking lots to switch those out where we're paying for those, those higher, higher energy lights um, where there's an alternative LED option, you should look at that. Vehicle fleet, um, we have an alternate fuel transition plan. So continuing with that, um, we've already got electric vehicle adoption and hybrid adoption happening now, but also looking at things like our mowers, which use a, a lot of fuel and they're actually less efficient than, than most gas vehicles. So moving those to an electric option um, would not only reduce our carbon, but it also reduces noise pollution. Uh, so there's, there's multiple benefits there. Employee commute. So telecommuting is, should be no surprise to anybody that's on this list. 2020 taught us a lot of things. Um, telecommuting being one, that we can successfully telecommute and still meet the needs of our citizens, um, albeit sometimes creatively. So adopting a permanent telecommuting policy for positions within the city. Uh, would help reduce employee commute gas usage. Um, looking at the possibility of alternative transportation incentives. So this is, is, this is a way for us to get our employees to consider something other than driving to work, whether that be walking, biking, carpooling, what have you. So looking at some kind of incentive there. And then of course, electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, as a lot of vehicles now don't have the short distances anymore with the electric vehicles, but I think it's so important that we provide some kind of vehicles charging at work um, so that we never have to worry about running out of fuel, just like the car. So having that available to employees is also important. Solid waste facilities. So this is looking at our purchasing decisions. Again, that you know a lot of waste can be stopped at the purchasing point. So updating our sustainable purchasing policy to reduce our waste there and then improve waste tracking. So improving how we track the amount of waste that we create at city facilities and seeing ways that we can maybe divert that waste. Water and wastewater treatment. So this is where the majority of our emissions come from because we use a lot of electricity moving water around. So looking at ways that we can either reduce that through energy efficiency means um, is one strategy we can use, or we can look at renewable energy integration. So for energy efficiency, we want to look at building electrification, energy efficiency upgrades to things like our pumps, um, our lift stations, uh, our built, you know, um, VFDs, variable frequency drives, those sorts of things. And then we are actually currently participating in the Department of Energy's SWIFT program, which helps us find ways to reduce our energy use at our wastewater treatment facility. And then renewable energy integration. Can we in anywhere integrate some renewable energy to help offset some of that electrical use for water and wastewater, water, water production and wastewater treatment? Okay. So now I'll go over um, a few quick things on the summaries, so comments we've already received. So a number of people have already expressed concerns over funding or expressed that we shouldn't be doing anything about this at all. Um, the, really this plan was, was developed in, under direction of council and funding mechanisms will include our typical ones like through our capital improvement program, but it also can include grant funding as we find it for some of these projects. Uh, it is, this is intended to be a living document. So this is not a be all end all plan. It's meant to be updated as we find new ways to be able to meet some of these targets and as technology changes and, and as needs for our community change. Um, we also received comments regarding the minimal inclusion of adaptation strategies in the plan. So to address things that are included in the um, 
impacts assessment that's included in the appendix of the climate action plan. And some of those factors that they want us to look at is increased flooding, increased um, heat waves, and um, climate migrants. And these are all really good things that, may, that we should take a look at. And so we're developing some actions along those that will be added to a later draft of the plan. And then we received uh, some comments regarding the health of the community forests as well. It's something that's really important to the city of Moscow and has been for quite some time. So we hope that this plan will be able to add, add to that. We want to enhance those, enhance and take care of our urban forests um, for them to do the job we need them to do, but also for their co-benefits like wildlife habitat, um, even shading, redu reduction of heat island effect and those sorts of things. Um, Notes. One more. Stop share. Oh, last one, important one. Okay, so tracking and updates is the other concern that we've had. Um, right now, there's no tracking or update plan written in. So thus far, we've done biennial updates on the. Um, climate action that has taken place for city operations. So we'll continue to do that, uh, as well as we will be tracking and doing, doing annual or biennial updates on that. Great, thank you, Kelly. So again, thank you to everybody who had uh, submitted questions before tonight's meeting. I did notice that there is a couple of attendees that had their hand raised. Um, we're not, the, the best way to submit something is if you go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A tab on the very bottom of the screen and submit your questions there. That's when they'll pop up and we'll be able to interact with those um, here on, on the chat that we've got. Um, so please, please use that mechanism to submit questions or comments that you might have about the climate action plan. Um, so yeah, as, as Kelly, I, I hope that helped. Um, please do visit the plan itself and read through the plan. One of the things that I do want to emphasize is that uh, this plan is a living document. Um, this is this is not intended to be written in stone because technology is changing quickly. And you'll notice that there there are there isn't a ton of specificity in every single one of these, and that is because these are strategies and actions that we can take. And then as we build programs that follow these strategies and actions, those will go forward to city council. And so the city council will, will consider each of those programs, strategies as we move forward. And we'll be incorporating these actions and strategies into the city's capital plan and into our budgeting as we move forward. So that that's there, there's a reason that this does this isn't, you know, a thousand pages long laying out specific details on every single one of these, that this is this is intended to be a guiding document that lays out the goals and the actions for how we're gonna move forward. Um, so I'm, we're gonna move now to the, the question and answer and we're gonna field some of the questions. We've had some questions coming in and we really appreciate those questions that you all have are sending in. Um, so we've got, uh, I've got a question here um, about will there be a separate climate adaption plan or will that be enveloped into this action plan? Uh, Kelly or Kyle, do you guys want to take a stab at that one? Sorry, I was reading one of the other questions. What was it? Is uh, the question about will there be a separate adaption, a climate adaption plan, or will adaptation be included in this plan? Adaptation will be included in this plan. So we'll add it just like we have the sequestration section, there will be an adaptation section to be added later. Okay, um, we have a, a question about, um, uh, we, we had a comment about adding an introductory paragraph that'll include positive statements about how climate action can help improve the entire community financially, make the community safer and healthier, et cetera. So asking about an initial section on that, and then also uh, thinking that it would be helpful to have a summary on page 25. So we'll take a look at those, at those items. A lot of the, um, as far as the summary, the initial summary with statements, a lot of that will be up to our city council. Ultimately, it will be a council adopted document. And so uh, the language that would be included here, our, our, our task is to draft a plan that can meet the goals that the council laid out for us. 
and then um, we will we will uh, get direction from the council in the April workshop on any sort of language that they want included initially. Um, Ty Tyler, if I may, sure, just address a, a comment or a statement Kelly made earlier. We do uh, intend to add a summary at the end that discusses the um, <clears throat> tracking and updates that will be ongoing. So th there will be a, a summary section at the end. Okay, uh, I've got a question that came in that said, what is the carbon level here now? Um, so here in Moscow, Kelly, maybe just uh, maybe you can speak to the emission levels that we know that we have here in Moscow. I don't know the number off the top of my head. So give me just a second. We are at 150,734 metric tons. And that and that is that is contained in the plan. If anybody would like, do you want to give me the page of that? The page number, Kelly? Page 12. So on page 12 of the plan, it has that. And if you have any follow-up questions, please let us know. Um, there's a question about will we be incentivizing community conversion to energy efficient appliances with rebates? I don't know that that's something the city can do, but I know that's something Avista has done, and that would be something that we could work with Avista on to continue to do and to bring back, um, as well as any other nonprofits that might be available to work with. And you know, as, as we look at the the timeline horizon for this plan, um, you know, it, it's. It's amazing to think of the things that have changed. Just for example, we've revised the city's alternate fuel transition plan annually since we first drafted that document about six years ago. We, we anticipated it being able to, to stand the test of at least a couple of years, but technology has evolved so quickly that we've had to update that. So with some of these strategies and initiatives, I, I'd be hesitant to say absolutely not because we don't know what will come down the pipe. One of the other questions we have kind of ties into that, it asked, how much money will we be given to Moscow from the federal government to help in this climate plan this year? And how can we track? So, you know, grants and those programs um, are already critically important to the city's coffers. It's, it's, a, it's a way that we pursue many major projects, including sustainability projects. For example, we have a project going out right now to install high-speed charging in the Jackson Street parking lot. Um, and that's that's a grant program that will be paying for 100% of that infrastructure. And so we will have grants that come through for this and, and the city's grants are all tracked um, through the city's budgeting process. And so every grant that we receive, we, we go through city council to receive that grant. But I do, I think it, it might be a really good idea for us to track separately the ones that are specific to climate action and, and have some sort of tracking on a website. I really like that idea. So appreciate that question. Yeah, and um, Tyler, if I if I may, we've we've received some some comments from the community about adding tracking and updates as a part of our tour to to the city's website, and so that that may be a, another item that we can uh, add. So great. Um, we've got a question about if we've considered including predictions from the Northwest Power and Conservation Council's 2021 Northwest Power. It predicts the cost of renewables. Uh, plunging and uh, that there are large changes in line for Pacific Northwest power generation. Um, I am not familiar with that plan, Kelly. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's something That's we, the, the, link, the link was provided. We really appreciate that. We'll take a look at that link and see if there's any information in there that would help inform this. Um, another question we've got is, are there any specific strategies related to future development? There seems to be a lot of housing going up. Is the increase in population considered in future emission predictions? Or projections, uh, excuse me. With with projections, they are. I don't include any projections in the plan itself. Um, but usually, when I run a projection, I I include a any a population increase of about a percent a year. Um, some years it's more, and some years it's less. So that gives me kind of a, a mid range. Uh, so I do consider that when I look at future emissions. And, and there, there are strategies that you'll find within the plan that are specifically related to new building. You know, it's a lot less expensive to have electrification of a building up front, obviously, than to retrofit buildings. And so there will be education campaigns. There will be efforts that are put toward working on that with, with development up front, even things like water conservation up front with development, um, all of those things that have a comprehensive impact on, on the emissions associated with new development. We've also recently adopted several new standards. One is a narrower street that you wouldn't think would have a big impact, but it has actually a large impact. 
when we have less asphalt to maintain. Um, and then uh, in addition, more dense, we have, we've, we've adopted several codes that allow for more uh, dense um, development. Um, and so, you know, things like accessory dwelling units uh, and, and, and more, more residential density so that we can encourage infill, which also has a positive impact. And those are things that we continue to pursue as we, as we are able and, and as state law allows. Um, I've got a question. It says, uh, can we speak more to the kind of community education you will do and what your expectations are of how that education will impact the community? Kelly, why don't you take a first stab at that one? Um, well, what I, my goal with any community, community education for this is to really make it Moscow specific. There's, there's a thousand and one resources on any one of these sustainability topics you can get online and access. But I think really bringing it locally will, will help citizens engage with it more. And the idea is to help change their own habits. Because uh, a lot of these things, reduce energy use in a house, isn't something the city can do for each resident. That's something the resident has to choose to do to help us meet these goals. So the idea is to change those behaviors incrementally. Um, the more outreach we can do and the more they hear it, the more likely it is to stick. Um, that's kid child education is actually really, really big on that. Um, it's amazing how much children absorb and how much they can change their parents' minds about things. Um, I have two kids and they do it to me all the time. So, <laughs> um, so that would, we would probably start there, but really anytime we can get in front of the community um, and engage with them to even hear what their concerns are. If we, if we're putting something out there that they're, they're not hearing or it's not making sense, we need to know that just as much as we do what can help us make this plan work. Yeah, there's nothing that moves me more than when my kids are disappointed in me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a good thing, which is often, I'm going to be honest, it's frequent. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, we've got a question that says that on page 17 and 18, it states that Avista has set aggressive targets to have carbon neutral electricity supply by 2027 and pro provide 100% clean energy by 2045. Since much of the grid decarbonization strategy seems to depend on Avista going carbon neutral, how is, I, I think what they mean here is how is a VISTA meeting their goals in the desired time? Um, you know, and that's, that's definitely an VISTA question. And I don't think any of us would pretend to be experts on VISTA's strategies moving forward. I know that, that there's some good information on VISTA's website. Um, and we have great local representatives from VISTA who can really provide good information about how they're moving forward with that. I can say that, uh, that Avista has been a great partner through this process. They are aggressively pursuing this and we really, we really, really appreciate having Avista as our energy provider because they do take it seriously and they have been working hard on it. Um, let's see. I'll answer that question. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a, co a comment here from Paul Kimmel, who's our local Avista representative. Um, and Paul says that uh, Vista looks forward to helping the city of Moscow achieve the climate goals and actions. They closely follow uh, the federal um, EV infrastructure funding for both public and fleet electrification and there are significant funds available for public charging infrastructure as well as dedicated fleeting infrastructure and vehicle subsidies. They're in the process of figuring out details of the opportunities and believe that there will be some help that Moscow they can receive to reach the climate action plan goals. Um, so yeah, we really, again, appreciate all the work that, that Avista does in that arena. Um, will you be creating a website that contains information, planting strategies, better insulation, um, about ways that we as citizens can participate to help solve the problem? Uh, no, Clearwater Power has a green energy program and some of us in Leita use Clearwater. And I would say that, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's a resounding yes. Yes, we want to have a, a resource page for citizens. This is, this is a community plan. When the council decided to expand this to the community, we know that setting a community goal requires the action of the entire community. It's, 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 an, it's an all of us thing. It's something that we all need to get on board and roll in the same direction to work toward this. It's, it's the old adage of, you know, do what you can where you are with what you have. And that's, that's really what we're trying to do here. Kyle, Kelly, Steve, anything you'd add to that? Um, just that part of that part of that outreach is will also be done with in partnership with local nonprofits um, that that are aligned with those goals. Um, it helps give them 
access to the public as, as well as us. It gives us a wider audience. Excellent. Okay, um, let's see here. I've got some more coming in. Uh, how much would the seeding of clouds with aluminum oxide make snow above Moscow that allows sky areas south of, make snow for above Moscow that allows sky areas south of us will be reduced to stop climate change emissions? And are they counted in the carbon footprint? Uh, 157,000 for here. Um, I, real, I don't, there, it's not something that we have considered within this plan as any sort of cloud seeding or any sort of activity like that. I, I, I don't know, Kyle, if you have anything you want to add to that, but. That's it's not something that's considered. No, we can we can we can uh, review that with some of the client uh, experts at the U of I and see if there's any a merit to that. Um, are you considering using a table at farmers market to present the plan and listen to suggestions from the public? Um, I would. We will certainly have outreach at the Moscow's farmers market. Uh, we will be receiving direction from the council. So our, our public comment period for this expires in about two weeks. We close that out on March 26th, I believe is the right, is the date that we close that. March 26th will be the, the final day for the formal period for public comment. Obviously, our, our farmer's market doesn't start until May, um, but we will certainly have outreach about components of this plan as we move forward. Um, we anticipate that the council at the April 25th workshop will give us direction about whether they want us to go back and work on other portions of this or if they want us to make any tweaks before they consider adoption of the climate action plan. Um, so depending on the outcome of that uh, workshop, there could be time within the farmer's market that we go back out for additional public comment, but it's possible that the council is satisfied with the state of the plan at that point and may want to move forward with adoption. And Tyler, um, if I might? Maybe. Sure. Uh, the uh, Sustainable Environment Commission uh, hosts a table at the farmers market every year, and it won't be specific to, the, of course, the open house and the climate action plan, but the general topic of climate action preparedness, mitigation, adaptation. Uh, we, we learn a lot talking to market goers, and we will continue to do that. We don't have the exact date yet, but the, the SEC will be at a table. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Um, We've got a question here. How much money will go to schools to help teach climate change and what protocols will schools have to follow if they receive money from the federal government and don't teach climate change correctly? That is a great question that I'm not sure I know the answer to. Um, a lot of it's because if it is federal money, we have absolutely no control over that and what they require of the schools. At this time, Idaho is not requiring climate change to be taught in schools, I don't believe. Um, that is something that I could do in addition to water conservation and environmental education um, in schools if teachers desire it. Um, but at this time, it's not being mandated to be taught in schools. All right. Um, we've got a question. Uh, Idaho Power has worked with the Idaho Division of Water Resources for some pilot projects around cloud seeding. Happy to connect you. Okay, so that's that's a comment that we'll we'll get connected on that and and get some information on that. Um, let's see. Will public comment be in person ever or only via Zoom? Um, at this point, uh, there, there is likely to be a public comment period when this goes to city council. Ultimately, that's the decision of the mayor. But generally, when there is a council action, then the mayor will open an item up for public comment. Given the nature of this, I suspect that the mayor may want to do that, but that's at the discretion of the mayor. And that would be in an open council meeting. Um, let's see. Sorry, my screen's a little weird here. Uh, uh, it was a clarifying question about uh, just thinking about the, this uh, about the farmers market question. Just thinking about the farmers market during the summer as you move forward. And yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's a great place for us. Always, it's a it's a real resource in the community for us to disseminate information. And so yeah, we we would definitely plan to have a table at the market and help provide information and use that as a as one of the many venues that we'll need to have to disseminate information. As Kelly mentioned before, we'll rely heavily on nonprofits on our public education and outreach with our school system. Um, we'll have a lot of different mechanisms for outreach uh, as we move forward. That was just to, just to add a little bit to that. That was something that, that council actually expressly asked us to do um, is to include a lot of public engagement in the plan. 
that's why you'll see it throughout on on many different sectors. Okay. Um, there's a question about how much money from the federal government is going to Avista, um, and if the governor uh, wants to see that happen, that's not a question that I'm I have any sort of information on. But uh, that's that's one that I I'm sure Avista could help provide some answers to. Um, and I think we've got one more. It's a question about the um, if there's any compost program at the university for some of their, uh, their uh, animal waste um, and how that might help with climate change. Uh, I can say that the university has uh, some, several programs that they're working on right now. They, there really has been a push for an uptick in sustainability efforts at the university. We had a meeting just today to talk about some recycling um, uh, issues that are going forward. I know that there are some discussions about potential composting programs. And so, yeah, I know the university is very interested in, in showing some really great strides toward further sustainability. Um, and I think that we can all anticipate hearing some more cool things coming out of the university uh, in the coming months as far as some of those efforts go. Okay, let's see. Uh, it says, in the city of Moscow, greenhouse gas statement to update, there's a statement that states, shortly after the completion of the report, the city administration looked into the usefulness of ICLEI and decided to cancel the city's membership. How long did the city discontinue its membership in ICLEI? Um, I believe it was a two-year gap. It wasn't anything significant. Um, really, they found, they found another way at that time to, commute, uh, to compute their, their emissions, um, and then it was found to not be as effective. As it goes, membership. Yeah, so it was there was there was a thought that it might be more efficient to to calculate those emissions um, otherwise. But then, as as we move forward, we discovered that that really the the ICLE, um structure is a really good structure for us to do those computations. And their technical support is is really, I mean, that really helps. City uh, staff. We have a question about how much electricity comes from hydro. And what are the emissions from that? And should they take the dams out? Um, you know, we're really not in any position to make a comment on the dams here. It's we don't have any dams within our jurisdiction or anything that we deal with from that. There is a significant amount of Avista's energy profile that does come from hydro, um, and so and that's that's green energy, that's clean energy that we get. Uh, Kelly, do you know what percentage of Avista's power comes from hydro? I, I know it's fairly high, and and that that information is available from Avista too. They they have really clear graphics that show their uh, their profile, their energy profile. I want to say it's around 56. Oh, wait, it's right here. 57 percent. 57 percent from hydro. Yep. It's on that uh, page 17, 18 under Avista's efforts to decarbonize. That's All right, I've got a question that. here that says, uh, regarding local businesses, can you, we pressure grocery stores to eliminate the open fridge refrigeration units? They're serious problems. Um, you know, as, as a customer, absolutely. You know, I think that that's, that's one of the biggest ways to get businesses to, uh, to move on certain things is as, as a customer to make your preferences known. Um, I know that we've seen several local uh, grocery stores that have converted to closed door refrigeration units rather than open refrigeration units. We've seen that. We've seen that process already start. Um, as far as the city, we don't have a mechanism to mandate that. There, there isn't. There isn't any sort of legal structure in which we could go and force that. Um, so really, the best mechanism for that is just the public expressing a desire to see that happen. Um, if I may, just real quickly, just to clarify. The 57% includes hydroelectric, wind, solar, and biomass. So 43% is uh, natural gas and electric, so. Perfect, thank you, Kyle. Uh, we have a question here, it says, as a member of ICLEI, are there any consequences on the city's part if we fail to meet the climate goals and the prescribed dates? No, ICLEI is, is predominantly a support mechanism for us. It provides us some technical assistance. It helps us to meet our goals. Um, at a reasonable cost, a really low cost actually, um, for this kind of thing. So no, there's no, there's no consequences to us. They will do what they can to help us meet those goals by those dates. Um, let's see. There's a question here about composting mass waste that I'm gonna have to maybe get some clarification on in order to give a good answer. So we'll do that in the online question and answer. 
Um, we have a question about what about charging for plastic bags in stores? Uh, that one, I believe we, we wouldn't be able to do that. That is something the state controls. So yeah, that's, um, we've been, the, the, the state has made it very clear that the cities cannot uh, eliminate or, or do that sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's something the state's taking plan. specific action on. Um, uh, in the state of Idaho, yeah, if the state, the, the, as a city, as cities in the state of Idaho, we can't do things that the state's expressly said that we can't do them, and that's something that the state has said that we we are not allowed to do. So that would that would require state action, not local action, on that front. Okay, I think that that is all the questions that we've had come in. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, please feel free over the next couple minutes as we do to submit any additional questions you have, and then we will obviously have on the city's webpage, the question portal will be open. So please continue to feel free to submit those questions. Um, and then we will, any question that we receive prior to the end of the public comment period on the 26th of this month will be included in our executive summary that will go to the city council. And so we will have those questions and responses to those questions that we will provide. Um, I would just again like to thank everybody for their participation. This is this is a critical item that the council has deemed something that they really want us to be working on. Um, it is a community effort, so it's really encouraging to see how many people have participated and signed on to this. Um, please, if you have questions, ask us, send it in. If it's something that, that we were not able to answer with a Q&A or through an email, we are happy to meet with you as well. If it's something that you'd like to come down to the office, have a chat with us, if you've got some ideas, we are so open to it. This, this really is intended to be a community plan. And, and often we receive just wonderful ideas from our residents. We're, we're, we're so lucky to live in a place where we have a lot of really smart people and we very much appreciate input on these. By no means do we consider ourselves the end all be all experts on any of this. And so really appreciate any of that interaction um, and appreciate you all signing on. Uh, does anyone on, on the panel have anything else that they'd like to add before we sign off? All right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Appreciate all of your time. I'm going to go ahead. We'll go ahead and leave this on for questions to be submitted um, right up through seven o'clock. Um, but uh, uh, that'll be the this will be the end of our formal presentation. And then we will circle back on any sort of on all of the answers from all the great questions you submitted. Thank you all very much.